start, if I might make one comment to you all. I found out in case you know what's going on. Doing this, his concept was, uh, Casey, I think what we ought to do is, uh, as is typical with my old friend Bernard, crazy <laughs> Bernard as I choose to call him, we have just a few more people in the anticipated. So I hope you don't mind improvising. On no seating, it shouldn't be really too bad. <laughs> well, we welcome you all here. Uh, you know, it isn't set up like an auditorium, so to shift around and go from one sheet to the other way. Very well. Nice to have you all here. And you're on, kid. Okay. I'd like to introduce to you John Lautner. <laughs> Good evening. I uh, also had the uh, message from Zimmerman that there might be 20 or 25 people here and uh, the no use worrying about what to do and so forth. But uh, I, I find rather than talking too much to uh, that I've been doing all my life and I find that that's probably the most legitimate and the most interesting and the most helpful thing I can do and I understand uh, I mean it seems you're mostly students and I don't know uh, I feel as though I've been starting all my life and uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm still a student too I've never I never get into that position of uh, feeling as though I were an expert or, or a voice of authority or any of that kind of stuff that you read about. I don't know where, where they get that, but uh, there's too much uh, talk and too much paperwork and I, uh, I believe in, in uh, doing whatever can be done to uh, encourage understanding and meaning and uh, of work in architecture. And so it seems that the simplest way for me to, it's such a big and involved subject that uh, I might say, uh, I think people are usually interested how one gets into whatever one is doing and uh, <coughs> in my case, I guess I'm talking loud enough. Is it okay? Um, I, uh, in college, I just uh, I took subjects that I was interested in, like I took uh, astrology and philosophy and all of the liberal arts. And uh, I finally, in order to graduate, found that I had a whole lot one subject or a major and uh, I guess you're all familiar with that problem <laughs> and so uh, I was uh, very serious I still am a serious student and, and of a philosophical mind and I was trying to analyze ideally what I should do and I and to contribute uh, rather than grab or something else. <coughs> so anyway, uh, architecture, I could see, included everything. It included basic thing like shelter. I, I was naive at the time. I thought that uh, uh, food, shelter, and housing, I learned that in the eighth grade. 
were basic. But when I got to be <coughs> practicing architecture, uh, I found that shelter doesn't very, mean very much. Food really means more, and uh, so it, it's it's a difficult profession. <laughs> Tell about architects that calling that, and this one checks, and this one checks, and I don't know how how they ever get a total idea that means anything because all of those things should be incorporated initially by somebody who's thinking about it <coughs> and and trying to do a a piece of architecture. Uh, I wonder if I could get a glass of water. <laughs> Just happened to be. So I'll I'll uh, start. I So I think uh, what I'll do tonight is just show some of the very beginning things and uh, describe those because build or the more you actually actual do the more you're able to think of, of uh, real and uh, uh, so I guess we'll start I'll get this I turn my on now I, I start with this because uh, people, uh, that's where I came from. That's uh, Lake Superior up in northern Michigan. So uh, I was born and brought up in nature where you have hundreds of miles of private beach. So Los Angeles has never really been a very intriguing place to me as far as beauty is concerned. It's a place to work. <laughs> now that when I was uh, 12 years old my uh, mother designed that my mother's a painter and my father is a professor and he liked to work during summers so my mother I designed I can't say really designed because it's a it's a it's a Swiss or Norwegian log cabin but anyway I worked on it uh, when I was 12 years old as a carpenter so uh, I uh, learned something about the building business starting at that age and uh, I like to point out here this uh, is a interesting maybe interesting so since we're in the uh, furniture showroom those chairs uh, my mother designed and my father built they're about uh, I guess they're about 40 or 50 years old and uh, uh, I suppose they cost about uh, 15 or 20 dollars at that time and uh, 
nowadays, uh, I don't know, uh, you, you can hardly afford to buy a chair. And uh, it's uh, uh, the same way with housing. Uh, the, the, the richest country in the world, you can't afford to build your own house. So uh, uh, you have to consider doing things yourself. This, this is the first house in Los Angeles. Uh, that's 1939, built for uh, $4,500. I, I borrowed the lot from an architect friend of mine and then I borrowed on the lot because I didn't have any money <coughs> and uh, was a filled hillside, uh, 20 feet of fill, so I used, uh, used I-beams as piles and on top of those piles are, uh, you can see it's sort of open underneath there. On top of the piles is a 6 by 18 inch reinforced concrete beam, which is the found in conjunction as the foundation. And at that time, that was uh, $75 worth of concrete. <coughs> so uh, it's very difficult for me to understand what's going on now because now I, uh, I can't, I mean, you couldn't build a house like that for uh, something like 150000 and. Uh, it's just uh, that's that's a that's the kind of progress we've been making. So. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, this one uh, I'm not sure if I have a plan. Uh, yes, extremely simple plan. Um, I I felt at the time uh, uh, that. Uh, Usually there are too many doors, too many rooms all boxed up with doors, and so uh, one, one of the ideas there was uh, practically no doors. So I do have an entrance door and a door to a kind of balcony bedroom arrangement. So essentially there are just two doors. Well, in a, in a typical two-bedroom house, I think sometimes there are 30 or 40 doors, and uh, that doesn't contribute to the freedom of living or space or anything and I found right away that there's no there's no b real basic thinking in housing or very little basic thinking in uh, in almost any kind of architecture you have to start right from scratch and uh, in this it doesn't show in the plan but uh, the one of the first things I did instead of having the typical back porch laundry like you're supposed to have like everybody else had, uh, I, I figured that the laundry was happening in the bedroom and opposite the bathroom, so I put a washer dryer right opposite the bath in the, in the closet. And uh, I've been doing things like that ever since. I mean, they, these are just details, but uh, it's, all, it's surprising to me how just that one, I think it took about 20 years before, or 30 years before anybody would dare not have a service porch and put the laundry someplace else. And so progress is a very rough thing to make. <laughs> so, but anyway, all you can do is do the best you can and keep at it. Now this, this wall is a hollow tile, the cheapest kind of masonry they used to use for office partitions and, and they would plaster it. So this is unplastered hollow tile and it makes a nice uh, uh, fireplace wall. And the wall also made a division between the living and, uh, and kitchen. This is a hilltop house uh, in Hollywood uh, with a panorama so that the, the living room is a kind of an island panorama, and uh, it's an all all redwood. And I like to describe some of these details just to show what designing right from scratch means. Uh, like these windows, for for example, uh, in typical buildings, uh, the window sill has always been a vulnerable place and uh, it's apt to leak and it's a maintenance thing and so I got looking at that and I designed these windows uh, top hung from the ceiling and overlapping the wall 
so they uh, they they completely eliminate the sill right away so I, I just totally eliminated a, an age-old problem uh, by uh, thinking about it. and also it, uh, it it creates a kind of a no draft ventilation and uh, just generally kind of a sensible way to do it it's hard to uh, this is the, the living room and then there's a dining with a little skylight and kitchen this side this is a, a one bedroom house uh, done in uh, uh, let's see that was uh, about 1940 41 uh, that was $2,500 <laughs> uh, I, I used uh, two by four rafters with the uh, canvas that's a canvas ceiling and then just uh, strips of wood and shingles so it uh, it was a real really minimum thing then uh, the uh, the war came along and I worked for contractors rather than architects to, to learn more about what actually happens on the job then toward the end of the war I started getting some work again um, and but you couldn't get contracts for anything so I started working on various methods of doing prefabricated independent roof structures <coughs> This is an example of one, uh, their plywood fence, which uh, not only support the roof vertically, but the big joint is a lateral support for wind and earthquake. And it's uh, unsymmetrical with, a, with a, just a little T on the other end to support it. So it's a, it's a live kind of structure, even though it takes all of the forces. And uh, I, I did uh, quite a few with different systems uh, so that you could, uh, uh, that shouldn't, uh, well it's mixed up there, uh, the, uh, you, you could have this roof erected uh, on a subcontract and uh, then just fill in between the floor and the roof and as much or as little as you want and you still have an entity that uh, that becomes a house some of these early ones here are mixed up and uh, they're enough to cover without talking about all of them that's a ski lodge that wasn't built this is another uh, well that's a motel down in the desert and I don't know what happened to the <laughs> photographs <coughs> Uh, that's a fireproof trellis. I, I, I used that uh, perforated metal, just perforated steel and had it uh, copper plated. And uh, it made a, there's another independent roof. There are three, three supports which uh, by extending one or two to different lengths it could fit any terrain and uh, then you build an independent floor <coughs> and you can have a 365 or 360 degree view and uh, uh, you, you don't have to worry they, again the supports take care of the lateral as well as uh, vertical and you don't need to have shear walls uh, in the way this this one had uh, uh, I don't know if it shows the wall. There's, there was a wall. Uh, no, swing. It swing swung out over the terrace by the pool. A whole wall opened up. And <coughs> this is uh, showing uh, glass. The end of a, of of the the living living room of one that we just saw a little while back there. Uh, A lot of people think that just uh, uh, you, uh, all you need to make a modern building is just glass, and uh, 
that way you get a very severe and awkward uninhabitable kind of thing and here <coughs> by uh, facing the glass to the view the fixed glass is faced to the view and the uh, sash is perpendicular to the view for ventilation so from inside it uh, uh, it also blends right into the plant planting area so uh, it's all a kind of a natural uh, enclosure which uh, well this is another uh, independent roof uh, with steel trusses and that's a very simple plan um, the uh, the trellis down the hall there uh, is a is a lateral support for the bottom of the trusses and also uh, a kind of a space division between the living and dining area and it, it again it's a uh, it, this kind of building could be done uh, the, the same way that they build factories that was that was the idea that it with enough uh, variety uh, you could build as they build factories and 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 come up with something that that's habitable but I, uh, I haven't found any contractors that understood this either, so I uh, uh, just did about a dozen with different kinds of systems and uh, uh, then went on to other things. <coughs> These are apartments in Westwood on a small 80 by 90 lot, and there are nine apartments, each with balconies and fireplaces. Uh, you can see the old cars there. <laughs> and it had a, uh, an internal ramp and stair circulation that was so easy that you could climb four flights uh, without an elevator and, and without really knowing that you're climbing. It's all open in the center. Uh, all these things uh, were problems uh, with the building department. For instance, uh, uh, with this one, I found that uh, the, uh, the code required fireproof halls between all these apartments. So uh, uh, that would completely wreck the whole project. So I had a rendering made and I showed uh, like fireproof tunnels running between the apartments and I took it to the board and they decided it was kind of silly so uh, I got it passed <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it, it, almost uh, it, I found that almost anything you think of is against the code so, uh, you have to uh, uh, but they're pretty reasonable in the end if, if you if you if you have a legitimate uh, reason that's a, a, a garage for mechanics and it had a, a radiant heated floor and a, a clear story light. So I, I thought that uh, everybody should have a good working condition, even, even mechanics. So uh, this was extremely simple with a gunite wall on the property line and uh, made a good working condition. It's all, uh, this is all, I guess it's half demolished now. This is a, uh, an all redwood house in a grove of live oak trees. The, it's a place where the clients used to picnic and ordinarily uh, you, you, you find a situation like that and then build, it, it becomes wrecked and, uh, with the building. So uh, I didn't cut down a single tree. This fits around all the trees and uh, <coughs> when you're inside, you're still in the trees, 
due to the, uh, the, way the, the way the glass is. I slope the glass so that when you're in the kitchen and dining and living, you can see up into the trees and you haven't lost the environment that, you're, uh, that you enjoyed before building. And the wall had, are two inch thick $30,000. This is a little uh, one bedroom house uh, on a hill, hillside and uh, it uh, no, no retaining walls just the uh, concrete columns and then underneath the uh, house became a, a garden patio and uh, by, these are old, old pictures, and some of them went through a fire. So I'm sorry they're not that they're not that good. But uh, by uh, having this porch uh, not uh, concentric with the with the column that supported the roof, uh, it, ga it gave it a freedom, uh, an eccentric freedom. When you're when you're in there, it's it's alive. So I think has to have a, a feeling of life or contribute to life or or of architecture. This is up in the Hollywood Hills. in a free space. See, uh, that's looking the other way. Uh, this is just the end of it. You can see the brick wall there. Uh, they get a little bit of an idea there. There's planting along the uh, one
the clients ask for. Well, And they're perforated, so they really do uh, take the place of trees and shrubbery and shielding. drop the ceiling and uh... <laughs> Refer to. I, uh, I'm just uh, here to do whatever uh, anybody wants to do. <laughs> These are uh, two. Uh, Back of Beverly Hills, they were they they uh, weren't weren't done at the same time, but uh, uh, close to the same time. <laughs> this one uh, is, is a concrete uh, roof 
um, well, floor is mainly concrete. Um, the uh, the deck up above there uh, includes a swimming pool, and the master bedroom and so forth is down below. And this corner is a master bedroom studio study. In the big concrete is the living room, and then the dining, and then four or five bedrooms in the wing back there. Um, it fits uh, built right into the rocky hillside, and uh, uh, it. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, getting rid of railings. Or ordinarily, you have a, <coughs> a house with a view or a building with a view, and the first thing you see is an ugly railing right in front, or something else ugly and uh, and uh, so by dropping this terrace and putting the bevel edge which also is good for sunbathing uh, I, I achieved uh, the equivalent of a rail without uh, interfering with the view <coughs> I don't know if we got another picture of that roof now uh, but you can see the natural concrete and uh, I think we'll get a better one with because of the view. There, that that's, uh, gives an idea of how it works. I had a draftsman at that time who liked to take pictures at night. And so he's the one that got those moon shots. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, client uh, liked to be in the sun, <coughs> so uh, there's an operable skylight over the dining and over the kitchen, so uh, uh, she could be in the, uh, actually be in the fresh air and in the sun anytime, anywhere, in or out. So, there, you know, there are just millions of things that can be done to suit different situations. The, uh, the, I think the unfortunate thing is that the public has no idea about architecture at all or what could or should be done and uh, unfortunately it's all controlled by track builders so that's, that's all that anybody sees. This, this is that uh, apartment down below if you told somebody before this was built uh, that they were going to have a bedroom underneath a pool uh, in all concrete, the, they'd say, no, we're not, you know. But uh, fortunately, these clients uh, had faith in me, so uh, uh, it, it uh, became a very pleasant situation. It's hard to describe here because of the that is, you can you can get some idea the bevel of the railing up above around the pool is an up and out uh, <coughs> space down below and also it forms a it, it comes to another uh, V over this column <coughs> which becomes a structural beam so that whole uh, interior space you can see the glass is disappearing and it, even though it's all concrete, is a very pleasant thing to be in. The master bath uh, also have, you could have a bath or a sun bath inside or out and be private. And then there are win windows from the pool to the master bedroom. <laughs> That's so they could keep track of the kids. Well, that, uh, well, that shows how the space works and uh, since, since uh, you are architectural students, this, this is a good uh, example. Uh, you, you see lots of, uh, or not too many, but <coughs> quite often you see independent structures of some sort and then when, they, when they're glassed in, they're ruined because they use a typical grid post uh, fenestration and uh, I hated to have this beautiful 
cantilevered concrete floor and then uh, have it look as though it's sitting on posts, which is what <laughs> usually happens. So by, by this detail of the glass, the glass just becomes a kind of a screen, which is what it should be instead of a structural element. And so there, there are uh, uh, millions of things like that going on in all of, in all of these things. They're, they're, so you, you, you have to think about everything you're doing. This uh, is a kind of a <coughs> interesting uh, combination of things. It's a, it's a rail that prevents a car from jumping the corner. You'll see it a little later on. And uh, as it comes down the hill, it, uh, it's attached to uh, steel plates that form another railing and, and form a stairway. <laughs> it's a combination of uh, things there. Uh, this uh, this house, uh, well, that's the uh, the ramp that has that where that rail initiates, and the the reason for that ramp is uh, in order to go from street to street and still stay on the property. I had to do this uh, to get enough length for a 20% driveway. <coughs> the, uh, these aren't arranged very well, the, the, the details before the whole thing. There's the, uh, the plan. Uh, <coughs> there's two lots on this side and, the, and four lots on this side in between two houses. And uh, so I, uh, I <coughs> by having these curved brick walls, I, I closed off the kitchen bedrooms and so forth and opened up the, the, uh, the view and the garden so that uh, uh, you, have a, you have as close to what you had before there was a building there. And uh, it, uh, uh, in, when you're in there, it incorporates the whole landscape. But, uh, uh, it, it, it increases everything rather than decreasing. That's a pre-stressed concrete roof and hanging glass uh, just cemented and that's a, um, a sliding door there <coughs> which is on a it's a helical curve. You can see it's curved in plan and in elevation. So we worked that out with a, in order to operate it, we had to have a flexible drive, so we got a, we, we finally found or built a, a, a flexible screw drive, which uh, operates that door. So, uh, and the reason for that is, uh, I had another uh, idea for that particular opening. I wanted to take the, the, the that area of glass and slide it this way as a windscreen and also it would make an opening which would be a very functional kind of opening as well but that would cause a track in the floor and, you'd, and so this particular owner no tracks in the floor no dirt no nothing so I had to compl uh, comply with the roughest kinds of requirements in, in most of these designs and particularly in this one I'd have to have at least 10 practical reasons uh, for one aesthetic reason to do anything. So we, we compromised on that solution. This, uh, I, I like to point out in, uh, in glass again, you have the free arch roof and uh, just fixed glass to the view and the doors, the pair of doors, which are now swung open, are perpendicular to the view, and they're a kind of a wooden glass screen. And uh, so uh, all of that works beautifully. I, I know some various things where a uh, more typical kind of uh, symmetrical architecture, you come in the front door, and here's a beautiful 
terrace or patio or something straight ahead. There's just another pair of doors with a transom bar and the whole thing uh, doesn't mean anything. It just, uh, it's just a, a habit, I guess. And no, nobody even thinks about it. <coughs> this uh, gives you the feeling of it and also these curved uh, things really go in the hills and with people. We, uh, I don't have the, I have a slide, but uh, uh, there is a, a helicopter shot showing this house on the hillside with a whole, uh, the whole neighborhood there of all little square houses and it, it's really a strange affair to see how, how well this fits in, in relation to all these little boxes that are stuck all over the hill. <clears throat> That was uh, right, right at the beginning of the silicone era. We, we didn't used to be able to do that with glass and have it permanent, but now the, uh, the silicone joint is really uh, permanently resilient. I don't know whether you know that, why, and, and, it does, and it does have an excellent bond. And by hanging the glass, you can have it that tall and still only quarter glass, quarter inch thick and take the wind because it's like a sheet of paper if you stand it on edge it buckles if you hang it it's stronger so uh, that's why uh, that detail we try to do everything in the most ideal fashion and uh, uh, that's <coughs> Uh, in incidentally, it's, it's interesting to me the how, uh, I don't know if you know how silicone really got in invented. Uh, uh, I worked on the uh, Johnson office building and the Johnson house when I was with Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, he had the glass tubing around the office building, if you've seen pictures of it. And it was a no. Nobody had a sealant that was uh, really adequate for that problem. And uh, Dow, Alden Dow, was there at the same time I was, the, the brother of the Dow Chemical Company. And uh, he took the problem back. And uh, Dow Chemical, over about six or eight years, finally uh, solved solved this problem and, and invented this uh, silicone seal. So. Uh, if you see, if somebody doesn't stick their neck out and do something, uh, nothing, nothing ever happens. And so, uh, that that's how that happened. If if uh, Mr. Wright had played it safe and used the same old aluminum bars, why well, we wouldn't have any silicone joints. slot in the fireplace was uh, ha has an adjustable bracket. It was originally for a piece of sculpture, so you could you could adjust it to uh, any uh, anything that seemed suitable. That's uh, that living room, incidentally. Before it was finished, we had some architectural meetings up there and we had uh, 300 people in little folding chairs in the living room. So that, uh, that's comfortable for a, a party of uh, 50 or 100 or for two. That, that's another uh, nice thing about uh, uh, achieving a, a real environment in architecture, it's, it's, it's human enough so that you're not, you can enjoy it as one person or as a hundred people. <clears throat> and this, uh, the reason for this is that that's the original grassy hilltop. So by building it in that way, <coughs> a, a 
maintain the original grass as a foreground to the view and uh, it just incidentally makes it a warmer kind of a thing than and a more friendly thing than just a barren glass wall. This is also interesting. You can see the curve of that wall that uh, supports the grass goes down into the floor and comes out and forms the pool beyond. So the, those <coughs> continuous uh, flowing lines are, are something that uh, you never get tired of. I think one, one of the aims in architecture, I think, in, in, in space is to have continuous, kind of continuous disappearing spaces, very, uh, which is very hard to achieve, but this is an overflowing pool, and uh, it's one sheet of water above another sheet of water, and uh, uh, in, in, this is a good example in the in uh, working with a client, <coughs> the client couldn't understand this at first and he didn't want to do it because it uh, will take a lot of trouble to grind that edge to an uh, absolute level and uh, and then the whole uh, well it was just he just thought it was too much of a problem and uh, so I I finally told him it was a giant skimmer so that uh, that got him right away. So uh, I, I got the effect of real water, and he got a skimmer. So it depends on what you're thinking about, you know. But you see what it does instead of being a hole. It's water because it's moving all the time. It's it's a it's a watery thing and uh, uh, extremely inviting. What keeps you from swimming off the end? Of it? Well, you'd have to jump out of it. <laughs> you, you, you'd have to be a dolphin. <laughs> that's that's a. Uh, Tub uh, where you can have a a bath and a sun bath. The the that the whole glass wall slides back, glass wall and roof. That's also uh, motorized. And that that's the light control in the master bedroom. No draperies. I don't think I ever have draperies. They're they're all private and uh, have views and light control and so forth <coughs> without drapes. I I include this uh, particularly when I'm showing slides in Los Angeles because I I get so tired of the smog I have to get a shot of the sky. <laughs> and, uh, that that's up in Sequoia Park. And so I, I just show that to, as a refreshing note in the, in the middle of smog land. And that's what we need is a refreshing note more often than we get it. That's an office building. The, that's a kind of a refreshing note. It, uh, it's interesting that that office building with all natural light and ventilation didn't cost any more than a standard rectangular concrete block office building with fluorescent lights and air conditioning. Same price, but uh, most people uh, don't even go into it. They just uh, assume that that's the way it is and they just uh, go ahead and do it the same way. And here's here you can see the internal clear story which provides internal light and ventilation and of course the perimeter is all glass so uh, people working there uh, uh, don't have to turn the lights on and they uh, they enjoy it so they uh, don't feel like they have to get out of it and go home as soon as possible <coughs> But it's hard to get with pictures. That gives you some idea how, how uh, in a very simple way, 
it's uh, all light and air and space. And I, uh, what, 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 I, what seems strange to me is, for instance, in the uh, architectural buildings, I mean, even the buildings for architects that I've seen, like uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, I mean, there's, there's no, no light, no air, no nothing. I mean, for architects, it, it's, uh, it, to me, it's insane. I don't know how, how they design things like that. But you got to be a politician, I guess. <laughs> That's a shopping center and apartments on a hillside down uh, Capistrano. It was uh, uh, the the mountainside was graded for it, but it was premature. These are precast concrete apartments that would fit on any kind of a hillside. And they're, uh, they're two-story units that could be either four or two. And uh, uh, by, uh, uh, and you can see how they fit in the hills. The, uh, the other project, one of the, one of the things that uh, killed it was the uh, fact that uh, the bankers required, we had inclined elevators and nobody had one, of course they do in Europe, but uh, nobody had one at that time. And even if they had one, the, the, uh, the banker said, uh, well, we've got to have somebody in the vicinity who's been maintaining an inclined elevator for the past 20 years. So, you know, if you don't have that, you can't do anything. So I've been fighting the bankers all my life. Uh, most of my clients are all cash. You can't, you can't get a loan for anything new, you know. You gotta do the same thing. Anyway, that's just another problem. <laughs> uh, these are studies in uh, density. I couldn't believe what, what, what they were telling me, that you had to have uh, apartments right on top of each other to, to afford to buy the land or pay the taxes. And I made several studies on six or eight or 10 acres, whatever that was. I guess it was more than that. And I found that you could have all kinds of open space and still have the, enough units to be economical. It just shows that they, they haven't even tried. Like this scheme up at the top is interesting. The circulation to those apartments is fanning out. And so when you go in there, instead of closing in, you're opening up. And uh, it just gives a, a clue to what can be done. This uh, was a design with the precast concrete, a square piece of concrete on a column. And uh, we're using, I think it took eight of them to make a house there. It was uh, over a canyon and so, and it was a small lot. So by having the living room up in the air, it still left a yard and patio and room for a pool. And uh, that was a simple structure too. This was for uh, uh, Caltech uh, Radio Astronomy Laboratory that uh, didn't get built uh, because uh, they had initially money from the National Science Foundation and then Nixon came in and killed it. So, uh, uh, but anyway, it was interesting working with the physicists. Uh, much simpler job than a house. Uh, the typical, uh, uh, I think the typical feeling is that big buildings and uh, unusual and uh, laboratories and so on are very complicated things, but they're nothing compared to the complications of a of a, of a real home, <laughs> all the things involved. This was, uh, I haven't entered any competitions, but this one I did for the uh, Roosevelt Memorial, that was uh, about 15 years ago or so now. And uh, I had a, a huge wall down the Potomac, which uh, saved the whole park. They wanted to save the whole park and not compete with the Washington and Lincoln memorials. And uh, so uh, th this was a drive-in gallery. You could drive in um, 
you can just see cars in the section there. You could drive in and if you didn't like what you saw, you could leave. If you liked it, you could park and come back. And uh, you could also take a walk on top of that wall. It was something like 2,000 feet long and it went up to 100 feet high. And so what the, the, what the winner of the competition was uh, some, uh, some uh, plaques, like marble plaques with some kind of uh, writing on them, you know, a very, very imaginative, uh, <laughs> brilliant solution that the jury could agree on. <clears throat> this is uh, several uh, preliminary schemes for that uh, uh, radio astronomy laboratory. Uh, this was with a suspended roof and uh, an interior garden and uh, uh, this one was interesting, um, well that's a couple of different schemes on one sheet. I don't believe in using too many sheets. <laughs> and uh, this, this, the one on the left there, a single unit just curved by, by uh, repeating it in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in that way. It became a very interesting, very livable kind of working place. These were some uh, preliminaries for uh, a laboratory building for the University of Hawaii in, at Hilo. And uh, that was very disappointing because uh, I couldn't find anybody over there that understood anything at all or, or gave a damn. Well, the, the, uh, the state was controlling the money and they didn't care about anything but the budget. The teachers didn't care about teaching or, or whether, whether it was a functional laboratory and uh, the master planners, uh, all they wanted was something the same as the building next door. So uh, <laughs> I had a... a